So in slides. What a great, uh, am I speaking now? Quick check on you having through okay? Oh, it's not for here. Good, good. <laughs> so to pretend that it's booming. What a great venue. Thank you very much to the Australian Data Archive for organising this. Uh, I don't know online if you can see that a magnificent sort of theatre almost uh, with a great backdrop. I do remember the old days when I would go and visit Steve at the other end of the campus in the little cottage that predated the university, so 1920s or something like that. And, uh, you know, there was a fireplace and a kitchen in the middle of their office and, uh, you know, cold in the middle of winter. Um, for those of you who know the ARDC, actually, we're still down there in those little cottages. In fact, um, one of them burnt down and was replaced with a demountable, and that's where we are. But anyway, it's good to be up the, the, the big end of campus here. Uh, and thanks very much for all the logistics and the beautiful uh, resources that you've applied to this uh, symposium. Uh, my name is Adrian, Adrian Burton. I work at the Australian Research Data Commons. Now, right there, we have a little bit of a mismatch there. I'm going to be talking to you about that, the context of the Australian research environment. Although we have, by putting out the call for vocabularies, we have um, participants from government, from industry, from well beyond Australia. Um, so I'll stick to what I was asked to, to talk about, but uh, we'll try and make it in sort of more fundamental concepts that, that do apply well beyond research uh, and well beyond Australia, obviously. But the examples are all from here. What a great welcome we had uh, from Paul. What a generous welcome. What a beautiful, uh, meaningful welcome. And so in reciprocation for the welcome, we acknowledge uh, the living legacy and heritage of uh, the, the great um, First Nations of Australia that really make this uh, a unique, whoop, a unique. I've broken the cameras usually. Yep. So uh, I'm from the Australian Research Data Commons, as I said. Uh, we are part of a national infrastructure strategy, NCRIS, National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy. I can see Natalia here, a number of uh, other participants from the National Research Infrastructure System. Uh, these are 24 national level facilities where we're providing really national scale services, assets, uh, infrastructure to support leading edge research. So when we're talking the infrastructure in the title of, our, of the talk today, um, this is infrastructure to support uh, leading edge research and stuff that couldn't be done by any individual research group or university, even jurisdiction, and you'll see some of it can't even be done simply by national uh, infrastructure. Our particular role in that, you've got sensors, sensor networks and laboratories and supercomputers, a lot of equipment that uh, has to be uh, deployed at national scale. Uh, Remit is uh, digital and data infrastructure at the national scale. Um, now, of course, digital and data is in all those um, uh, facilities are technology enabled, um, but we're looking at you know, what needs to be done at the national level uh, to support uh, this transformation of research. So as part of that, we do everything from policy, skills, training, cloud, storage, as you might expect, but we have a program called National Information Infrastructure. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about, the, that knowledge infrastructure that we bring. And there's things that can only be really done uh, at the collaborative national scale. <clears throat> Got my water? Oh, thanks. Uh, 
That's not what I thought. That's what I thought. So our um, infrastructure generally is in these three categories of uh, catalogs, identifiers and uh, vocabularies. And so that's the context as far as we're concerned for providing these services at the national level. For example, we run a national uh, consortium for the minting of uh, DOIs with DataSight for um, models, software, data sets, uh, a number of non-traditional um, uh, research types. Uh, we run a national catalog to find research data uh, and we have this uh, vocabulary service that I'll be talking to you about uh, a bit more. These are uh, this category of national information infrastructure. So it's not in any single university or any single nation's uh, remit to provide a global identifier system for data sets. Just can't be done. So that's what uh, this national and global infrastructure is here to do, to support the work of our scientists, uh, the, the work of our research sector uh, with the information infrastructure that's required and can only be done at that collaborative level. There's no, what's the point if the ANU has a brilliant way of identifying data sets, uh, if it's different from Melbourne, which it obviously would be, has to be. Um, and then, you know, it doesn't make any sense if I'm referring to a data set and then the British and uh, the uh, Japanese have different ways of doing it. So these are infrastructure systems. They're beyond the individual research groups and institutions and they're part of a national or international system. So that's the kind of uh, work that we do. Uh, we've been behind the, uh, the founding of the ORCID Consortium and uh, it's running in Australia. Uh, we're running these national scale discovery services uh, across the whole sector and um, synchronizing them with uh, discovery uh, over the world. And then in vocabularies, um, I keep saying to our staff, we're trying to reduce the amount of vocabularies in Australia, um, which might be counterproductive because counterintuitive, you know, we're trying to increase the number of data sets, increase the things uh, identifiers, but actually we're trying to get people to use uh, semantic standards and to have uh, them adopted and adapted. Uh, and so we have a, a vocabulary service is the first sort of step in a set of semantic services. I'll start with catalogs just to give you a little bit of, hello, how are you, Adrian? Oh, no. <laughs> um, catalogs to give you the, um, the sort of context and it will build into why we have vocabularies in one sense. So uh, a lot of this stuff I've talked about is research system information. We're talking about the whole of research uh, in multiple different nations, multiple different organizations, um, a way in which people often look at, uh, you know, I want information about data sets. So example, the catalog I gave you there. What we're looking at there are the outputs. So you're looking at it as a system kind of program view and there's, inputs, activities, outputs, outcomes, and impacts. And what we were asked to do, well, let's have a look at those. What do we mean by an input? There's money, grants, investment, uh, organizations, there are inputs into this research system. You've got facilities, um, some of the uh, national facilities and other uh, infrastructure facilities. Uh, you get your people, as part of the input and then they start to work on the activities which is the project outputs we all know number one journal articles but uh, as the world becomes more nuanced data sets models uh, some of the semantic artifacts we talk about today are considered they would normally have been considered as byproducts and uh, today they're being considered as outputs Outcomes would be, you know, when is it used and when is it applied to government or industry? And then in the end, the impact would be measured by um, prosperity. Um, what have I got there? People and the planet. So that's a way of looking at uh, some of the artifacts and actors in a research system. And quite often 
this information infrastructure that we're talking about today is trying to talk about all of those things to you know to talk about what's happening in in the research system so as an example and of course as i was just saying that happens all over the world in multiple government agencies in multiple research institutions in um, industry and a, a number of service players so when you're trying to bring together information as we were asked to do for example in research data australia we were asked to bring together the information about data outputs from research bring it together from all these different sources uh, in our case across australia in other cases in other catalogs that's uh, worldwide and then take that information about the outputs and bring it all the way up to the beginning of the process and make that a facility for input into new research so that that's the the function of uh, the catalog at this at this point is to take those outputs make them available then as new inputs so that the people and the projects can then use them in in new and innovative ways so why am i talking about the research system well quite often that's the context that we kind of get in order to run this kind of uh, knowledge infrastructure and here we were asked to provide that and people said well i just don't want a list of data sets i need to know what papers were related what project projects they came from who were the people what facilities did they use what organizations were behind it and where did they get their money so already the, the uh just trying to bring together information about data sets from all these multiple uh information sources i'm ahead of myself what should i be saying now steve <laughs> I think that's where we were did i yes that's exactly where we were so not only were we trying to bring together information about data sets and software etc but all the linked you know other bits from the research business process now even just bringing together one item from all these different sources has its uh challenges and so then let's talk about that that's why we start to get into this knowledge infrastructure Lucky I had practice at that uh, at the uh, didgeridoo uh, earlier. Good. So, thank you for bearing with me with that context. Now we're getting back into the sort of meat and potatoes of knowledge infrastructure. What was the challenges that you get when you try to do that? I remember very clearly Melanie and some of the developers at ARDC coming into my office and saying, Adrian, we've got all the researchers from all over Australia and we've piled them into this big, you know, national research out of Australia. But I've got, uh, I think it was 800 references to uh, John Smith. Uh, have no idea whether they're the same. You know, this is 2006, seven or something like that, eight. Uh, we have no idea whether it's the same person or how do we bring them together? You know, uh, are we going to create all these, each of the mentions of the data set from different places around the institution had a different um, reference to a person. So I said to them, I remember quite clearly, well, you're going to have to do something about that in the short term, you know, we're by data cleansing and, you know, topic modeling and bringing stuff together. Uh, and in the long run, we will look to work with the sector to get proper, uh, to fix up the inconsistent referencing and the duplication of information. So that's 2009, we decided to pour money into the National Library to create a, a national identifier for people in Australia. And one year later, people in the journal said, oh, actually, we should have ORCID. And so our local um, sort of initiative to have 
precise referencing for people, for researchers in Australia was kind of overtaken by an international system, which was great. We were ready to join up. And so now, you know, fast forward, when we get information from different research institutions, even government facilities, research facilities about a person, then we can just say, don't tell me that it's Brian Schmidt or BP Schmidt or Brian Patrick Schmidt or Professor Schmidt. Just give me the orchid and uh, that's a precise reference. And we can run a distributed information system across the whole research system uh, by having a consistent referencing, um, by getting to these, uh, to the siloed duplication. All the information about Brian Schmidt had to be copied into all these different systems, you know, uh, across the place. So that, uh, was actually the segue, which I probably should have done a little second ago, from where we started in catalogs and said, well, actually, you need to have identifiers. Uh, we need to be able to persistently identify the different uh, players in the research system. So what do persistent identifiers bring to that problem? It's a consistent way of, of referencing some of these artifacts and actors in the research system. Remember, I've, that's why I brought up the top sort of paradigm we're using there is the, the, the business process of research. And there are different artifacts and um, actors involved there. And the persistent identifiers that you know a DOI is for persistently, is for referencing the journal publications, the uh, data sets, software, increasingly grants so you know that's the business that they're in you know orchid is there for for persistently identifying the people and um we've got the emergence of roar and a few others for organizations so those things that everyone knows about the very famous international persistent identifier systems they are designed for this problem for talking about the research system oh that's all right I'm getting used to being pretty subtle in this talk. Um, I thought we were going to have to evacuate. That's a pretty nice. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> now, where on earth was I there? I was right in the middle of the flow. Does anyone remember? Um, I have no idea where I was there. <laughs> um, yes, persistent identifiers, uh, the ones, the famous ones that we know. Orchid, DOI, everyone knows about them. Uh, they are for this purpose of identifying, precisely identifying actors throughout a very complex system. I'm not sure whether I kept slides or not. Yes, so I'll go through this very quickly because it's a very Australian context. The thing called excellence in research in Australia, uh, it's like the REF in the UK, it's looking at, you know, well, I'll show you what it's looking at. It's looking at how many publications there are in Australia, basically. And so that's uh, now, you, you, if you follow the news in Australia, that used to be done as a survey. Now they're saying, we're going to do it as a data, was it data enabled uh, new process for collecting that information. So that will be based on uh, consistent you know, use of DOIs and and this kind of aggregation across the system. Uh, engagement and impact is another thing that we have here in Australia, an audit of that, and that's bringing together, trying to identify those um, artifacts of the system. One that everyone probably knows is the H index. What are they doing with an H index? They've got all the DOIs for all the journals in the world. They're related. Uh, cross ref that's what cross ref exists because it's the cross referencing between all those publications uh, linked to who is the author and then out comes a pretty dodgy algorithm out the other end but uh, setting aside whether we love or hate the h index uh, what i'm trying to say here is that the tools to make that kind of global information system about research uh, were invented by the journal publishers uh, and they had to, because there's millions, if we're talking about all the research institutions, all the papers, all the people in the world, all the, the researchers in the world, that's, well, you're talking hundreds of millions of publications. Um, I think it's 
tens of millions of researchers and you know lots of these so if you've got it all that mixed up in a big system they had to have a way of precisely identifying what application am I talking about and what researcher so they were the ones who invented DOI and ORCID for this for that purpose um, now it does uh, so it, it the identifiers that we use come from that paradigm Now, vocabularies, How, you might be asking, what on earth has this all got to do with the vocabularies? Well, okay, it's knowledge infrastructure and more broadly. So what does it have to do with vocabularies? Well, as it happens, quite a lot and not much at all. We'll get to that. So go back to this example, uh, and again, to my poor development team. Um, we uh, constructed, remember, a search data Australia, the aggregation of all the data sets and algorithms and software across all these organizations in Australia, uh, linked again, uh, made as an input for research and linked to all the other outputs. When we did the user testing and the requirements, the researchers said, well, we brought together all that a, because it was part of policy to put data sets in the context of their you know, outputs and outcomes, you know, put it in a proper context and people wanted to know which data set was created by which people. That was a, you know, a, a very good use case. However, when we did the actual user testing, um, the researchers said, oh no, I'm not searching by ARC grant. I'm not searching by... Um, um, an orchid identifier, and uh, I'm searching for the soil map of ACT. And so Melanie, uh, Melanie is here. Uh, Melanie was involved in some of those interviews where we said to the researchers, okay, what are you actually looking for? And they're all ideas. They're all concepts that none of them were the artifacts of the research process that we we're talking about before the grants and the institutions and the and the people some the people to some extent i'm i'm being a little bit poetic there but these are real uh, and we've also had ming fang from our team which a lot of you should know if you've never met ming fang you should she's been doing analysis over the actual you know these are actual queries when people come to it we've got the logs that we constantly uh, analyzing so people are looking for Recordings of the Latmul language. They're looking for spatial, biophysical, intertidal, and subtitle data sets. So that's what's making the scientists run. You know, not unsurprisingly, it's the ideas. That's what that's what makes a, you know our sector is not uh, an ordinary production sector. Uh, it's the ideas which are at the core. So. Uh, Again, the developers are saying, well, you know, still it's not easy. You know, the co concept of intertidal uh, coming to us from industry research facilities, institutions, and governments, it's exactly the same problem as we had with uh, Brian Schmidt. Uh, it comes to us in all these very, uh, in fact, I've probably got a slide I should keep up with myself. Otherwise, how am I going for time, Steve? Okay, so we had exactly the same uh, problems trying to bring together ideas across all of that uh, distributed system. You get the same kind of thing. The concept of intertidal is siloed in organisations. It may it might be it, it might be defined, or it may not be defined, or it may be poorly defined. Uh, it's certainly not connected to the other ideas. And even if we were talking about the same idea, being able to actually precisely say that by referencing it uh, was not possible. So funnily enough, that's why I say, actually it, it, they are related, but not exactly. So a vocabulary service then uh, from our point of view was a, 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 an initiative to have the concepts out there shared uh, as a community resource, not siloed in back in the institutions or the the tables of the of data set of uh, databases all over the place, to have them precisely defined, 
uh, connect other um, references and to provide consistent referencing. Now, my model that breaks down a little bit because of uh, the consistent referencing um, uh, IRIs and um, we've got Richard up the back here. Everyone should know Richard as well from our team who uh, is working on uh, both our vocabulary service and uh, a new uh, persistent IRI service uh, to support um, link data URLs. So the three-part model that I introduced at the, at the beginning still uh, plays, but they're, they're not necessarily separate things. I've introduced our vocabulary service in the context of the story of the catalog. Uh, and then certainly vocabularies, terminologies, precise semantic referencing does have relevance for discovery, for you know, data discovery or other uh, resource discovery across a research system, but it really comes into its own in data integration. We did talk about data commons at the beginning. I'm going to refer to them sporadically throughout the talk. Here's something we're doing with the social science data commons uh, program in Australia. Um, and it's a, uh, what do you call it? Napkin, uh, a napkin diagram from the God's Cafe seminar series between um, Steve and I, uh, where <laughs> it is. <laughs> It happens every Tuesday over coffee. So we were talking about a problem that was, it is relevant you know, across research, but here I'm just giving it some context in social science. If you think about a big national data set, for example, a census or the census in Australia, and then you think about a local data set, um, let's say a survey of Cabramatta, there's concepts that are being, you know, scientific concepts that are being um, surveyed in both. But do we know whether we can integrate the two? If I've asked a question about employment or um, social attitudes or something, do I know that that's the same one that was in the national data set? Well, possibly, um, but not always. And quite often, uh, the ideas that are in these national surveys, and I've just given four examples of the census here, I'm not saying anything necessarily about the Australian census, but quite often uh, the concepts are hardwired back into some big database system as the column headings or keys or something. Uh, and the definition that they're using is never really exposed out for anyone else to really use. And so, same thing here, Breitspark researcher says, I'm gonna ask a question about that and it's gonna be great. And then their idea goes hardwired into the survey. And even if I, want to, if I wanted to, if a third party was gonna come in and say, are they talking about the same thing? They probably wouldn't know, nor would the two parties. So the idea of vocabulary service in this context is to provide a, an independent point, a community reference, uh, a community supported reference where um, a research repository, uh, the researcher and the, or the software provider of the survey tool and the researcher doing the survey, as well as the national body uh, are working with um, community uh, enabled uh, concepts. And we can know that if I've asked a question about employment, then my data set is going to be so much more valuable because it's going to um, immediately, I'll be able to draw um, conclusions from population trends, and also when it gets to the research repository, they'll know what to do with it because they know that what that concept is. So that's uh, the the concept that we're building within the social science data commons, and there's quite a few projects around that at the moment. Here's another one. Dougie, thank you. Uh, we're doing some work. We've got a people data commons, which is to do with health. Um, and uh, here's an example where people are using um, standard terminologies, 
But uh, the example on the, I just stole this from a, a Google search, uh, is SNOMED CT and then the NCI thesaurus. Uh, but the kind of use case that we're working through with Dougie is New South Wales Health and Queensland Health have both implemented standards, but in slightly different ways. And then every time a research health study has to happen, then they're doing the uh, mappings themselves. And the mappings, you can't convince Queensland to you know, have a, an official mapping to New South Wales or New South Wales to have an official mapping to Queensland is none of their business, but the researchers are keep to keep doing it. So part of the work we're doing with Dougie is to look at, can we make these mappings uh, an artifact that could be uh, part of our vocabulary services? So already we're moving into new areas uh, um, around that. Now, in both those, I've got to say here, once you've got it on the slide, it looks like, oh, ARDC are doing that and have solved that. No, we are working on uh, these scenarios with uh, both those communities. The social science was the example from here. Here we're working with the health studies uh, research community. When we, now changing gear here. Uh, so just uh, when we were talking about data integration you know, in the social science example, uh, you've got a domain that's working on a particular problem. And they can work together and say, gee, it'd be great if we all collaborated. What happens when you get to impactful research? Remember that was the title that we were talking about, knowledge infrastructure for impactful research. Impactful research almost always starts with a problem and doesn't obey discipline or administrative boundaries and says, okay, well, what are the social determinants of her health? And then the poor researcher has got data coming in from education, healthcare, you know, urban environment, uh, employment. Um, and so, or as we in, found in our bushfire program, in order to understand development risk. So what's the risk of developing a, a suburb in the north of Canberra? Uh, well, that depends on, <laughs> that depends on fuel loads, fire behavior, um, environment, the, the environment itself. Um, it depends on air quality when there are fires. It then, uh, the different health, repercussions of uh, of the fire so in order to just ask a simple question you know what's the impact of having a suburb in that spot uh, which is fire prone the poor old researcher has got data from a number of different domains so remember Steve is getting this sorted out for a social scientist doing research within social science and integrating data with other big social science things, but now he's ending up as part of a multidisciplinary um, community. Data integration at this level quite often, and I'm using a really shorthand here, quite often starts with saying, oh, well, it's happening in this place and at this time. So there's a, an initial data integration between the air quality, let's say, and the health data set by saying, okay, when, what, when was it? And where was it? And what was the air quality like at that point? And what was the, uh, the health outcomes? Were there um, hospitalizations or asthma? So you, the initial linkage is kind of done on time and place. But then, it, you know, that's fine, data integration. No, uh, then you've got uh, um, correlates in two totally different domains, health, data is collected and the concepts in health data are managed in a totally different way to the way that the air quality people collect their data. So you've got, you know, a rise in, 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 in or a decrease in air quality and an increase in uh, hospitalizations. You try to actually, you've got researchers trying to work in those two different areas now. So if we go back to right at the beginning, uh, we've now not only got we're trying to get concepts not from different organizations, but from different conceptual communities. 
And all the stuff we said in the beginning about making the assumptions clear, uh, the definitions and the references apply at a degree of difficulty that's, that's just a lot greater. And so we can't just have the assumptions about, oh, when I said um, hospitalizations, surely you understand what hospitalizations mean. No, we've got to bring those out into uh, artifacts um, that, that will allow uh, scientists from different domains to be able to take those concepts and work with them as well. So all the more uh, important about taking care of our, uh, our scientific concepts in these semantic services. I think we'll hear more about this from Simon tomorrow, Simon Hodson, but this area of uh, 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 the importance of semantic infrastructure to support these things, this kind of interdisciplinary research can't be underestimated. I should stop there, but I'll just tail off, taper off instead of stopping at the, the big bang of bushfires and world peace and et cetera. We'll go back into some knowledge infrastructure stuff. Uh, as part of the knowledge infrastructure, we need to curate the knowledge. So it's, there's another level of service and infrastructure required because first of all, we're talking about words and concepts and things and they are as slippery as, as mercury. Uh, you're trying to say what is anger, you know, and we're trying to use what is a, a slippery, uh, quite subjective communications concept. And we're trying to use it as a precise scientific um, tool in a semantic infrastructure, which is okay. But if we just leave it, it's going to be like mercury and it'll just go all over the place. The, what the assumptions about the concept uh, will change. or And so it needs definition. It needs leadership and governance from a group of, uh, uh, of leaders within research and government uh, to curate. When we say this is a concept, you'll need it. Uh, this is a concept. This is what we mean. And you can use it in public administration or research, but it's not like other, it's not like a telescope. Uh, you put it out, it doesn't start changing on you and you know, morphing and, and uh, turning into something else the, the way that uh, uh, human uh, concepts do. Uh, and the examples here, you know, that's what knowledge was, you know, a certain time ago. So knowledge also grows. So that's why it needs to be curated, our knowledge um, organization systems need to deal with growth in science, uh, as well as whole new fields of science that just appear over time, as well as the normal uh, tendency of a concept to be clear in my head, but not exactly the same clearness in your head. So all this just means that, that governance in our kind of infrastructure is very, very important. Uh, and it's about community, it's about defining our community. Um, and uh, having, um, you know, uh, having the uh, governance over the, the semantic content. So what does that mean for infrastructure? There's a, there's a, there's a role in the infrastructure to um, help to maintain uh, versioning, you know, to be really prosaic about it, uh, versioning profiles, different um, uh, artifacts uh, that, that, um, curate the knowledge over time. And then the last one, uh, of course, things get more and more complex. We started with vocabularies. Um, there is a complexity of, of semantic um, approaches that, uh, that um, portrayed in this uh, graph, the graph there. Uh, we started with, uh, we started with the vocabulary service because that's a very concrete list of things that come into everyday science. Um, of course, those lists tend to want to be coalesced into um, more comprehensive worldviews where the lists become classes of things and those classes are then related to each other in a much more comprehensive view, uh, either an ontology of the whole world or a data model for talking about uh, a broad area of science. Um, we have a vocabulary service, uh, and part of our challenge now is, okay, well, as the 
um, information science becomes more and more embedded into the rest of the research sector. Uh, how should our um, cement, how should our vocabulary services um, evolve? And so, um, what would this look like in the future where we're not just talking about vocabulary services, but the semantic services? So that's why we uh, are part sponsors of this uh, conference today. This symposium is for us to be informed by uh, where the scientific um, uh, initiatives are going, what the information science is that's required to support those, and what are the new directions for our vocabulary services that could um, support more broadly um, the semantic needs of our leading edge research. So thank you very much.